Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Duncan Brown, and I am a trustee with the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. Um, I hope this webinar finds all of those tuned in safe and well. Before I introduce Dr. Charles Kupchin, I don't know whether I pronounced that right, Kupchin? Kupchin, just fine. Kupchin, thank you. A quick announcement regarding the logistics for tonight's webinar. We are using the Zoom webinar platform tonight, so everyone is automatically muted and will stay muted. Additionally, the only persons you should see on your screen will be myself or Dr. Kupchin. Tonight's webinar will include remarks by Dr. Kupchin followed by a Q&A session. Audience questions will be handled through the Q&A function in Zoom. The Q&A button should be located on the bottom of your screen. Just click on the button, type in your question and hit return. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs YouTube website in about two weeks. And now to tonight's speaker. Dr. Charles Kupchin is a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a professor of international affairs at Georgetown University. From 2014 to 2017, he served as a special assistant to the president and senior director for European affairs on the staff of the National Security Council in the Obama administration. He was also the director for European affairs on the NSC during the first Clinton administration. Before joining the Clinton NSC, he worked in the US State Department on the policy planning staff. And previous to that, he was an assistant professor of politics at Princeton University. Dr. Kupchin has also served as a visiting scholar at Harvard University Center for International Affairs, Columbia University's Institute for War and Peace Studies, the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London, and I'm going to butcher this, I'm telling you, here it comes, and the Centre d'Etudes de Recherches Internationales in Paris. Yeah, you butchered it, you butchered it, but that's Sorry. okay. <laughs> and the Institute for International Policy Studies in Tokyo. My French is not very good. From 26 to 27, he was the Henry Kissinger Scholar at the Library of Congress and a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. From 2013 to 2014, he was a senior fellow at the Transatlantic University. He is the author of many, many works. There's a lot of them out there. You can Google them and you can find those. But his latest book, Isolationism, A History of America's Efforts to Shield Itself from the World, was published in 2020. He received his bachelor's from Harvard University and his master's and doctorate from Oxford University. Tonight, I've asked Dr. Kupchin to discuss the history of the US global engagement since the founding of the United States through the late 18, 1800s, through the two world wars, the Cold War, the unipolar moment, and of course now, and then to discuss where, when, and why should the US engage in various regions of the world today. So please join me in giving a warm, albeit virtual welcome to Dr. Carl's Charles Kupchin. I'm stumbling over my words tonight, I'm sorry. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Duncan. Uh, and thanks for putting this event together. It's a pleasure to, to spend the next hour with you and your colleagues. Uh, I only have one regret tonight and that's that I'm not up there in Baltimore in person uh, because I'd rather be able to see folks and engage in back and forth, but I guess this is the best we can do for now. Hopefully, things will start getting back to normal uh, before too long. Well, let me, let me begin by offering up a summary of the argument that I wanna share with you tonight, and then I'll spend the next 20 minutes or so putting some, some flesh on the bones. The, the core message that I wanna begin with is, is this. I think we've been through two long eras of American statecraft. One lasted from the beginning, 1789 until 1941. I would call that the era of isolationism when the United States generally tried to avoid strategic commitments outside of North America. A second period from 1941 until the beginning of the Trump presidency, which is the era of liberal internationalism in which the United States did the opposite. Instead of running away from the world strategically, it tried to run the world strategically. And that's why we ended up with hundreds of bases and troops uh, in, in basically quarters of the globe. I think beginning with Trump's inaugural address in which he said, from this day forward, it will be America first, only America first, picking up the refrain from the isolationist group that formed in 1940 to block Roosevelt's interest in getting more involved in World War II. Since that day, I think we're at the beginning of a, a third era 
And it's not going back to isolationism, but it is a change and we're discriminating kind of approach to the world than we saw from World War II through the Obama administration. And I think in many respects, Trump was elected partly because he tapped into a sentiment in the American electorate that basically said, hey, too much world, not enough America. What about us? Too many wars, too many trade, free trade pacts, too many alliances, too many immigrants, what about us? And in many respects, Trump tapped into that sense of resentment, that sense of globalization not working to the advantage of enough Americans to bring back in, into, into vogue a more difficult isolationist, unilateral protectionist brand of uh, American statecraft. But even though I think Trump was tapping into a voice in the electorate, he dramatically overcorrected. He dramatically overcorrected for overreach. And so I think today Biden's task is to correct for Trump's overcorrection, to learn important lessons from the Trump era, but not to go back to pre-Trump because I don't think that's what the American people want, rather to find an, a stable middle ground, to step back and focus more on the home front, but not step away as Trump was, was doing during his presidency. So that's kind of uh, the quick and dirty version of the message I wanna share with you tonight. Now, let me talk a little bit about era one, the era of isolationism, era two, the era of liberal internationalism, and then end with some thoughts on where I hope Trump, uh, a Biden takes the nation over the course of the next three and a half years. As I said, I think that the era of, of isolationism began very, very early in American history. It began in some ways even before the United States was an independent nation. And that's in part because the US was entangled in the affairs of Britain, France, Spain, extraterritorial imperial powers that were hemming it, to, hemming it in. And one of the guiding dictums of the founders was we need to free ourselves from predation, from coercion by foreign powers to enjoy the natural security that comes with North America flanked by large oceans to its east and west. And the model treaty that was negotiated by the Continental Congress in 1776 basically said, we want trade with everybody strategic connections with nobody. And that was in some ways the guiding light of American strategy from that time onwards. Two years later in 1778, the United States broke with that dictum and did form an alliance with other powers, namely the French, but that's because we were losing the Revolutionary War. And even though neither George Washington nor other founders said, we like alliances with other powers. George Washington reached out and fashioned an alliance with the French. And in many respects, it saved our skin. We might still be a British colony. We might still all have English accents had it not been for help from the French. Now, what's interesting is a few years later in 1793, not long after we succeeded in breaking from Britain and becoming an independent nation, Britain and France went to war again. The French reached, reached across to George Washington and they said, hey, that alliance that we forged with you in 1778, it's still on the books. We pulled your chestnuts out of the fire. Now, how many ships, troops and arms are you sending across the Atlantic to help us? Well, what did George Washington do? He issued the proclamation of neutrality in which he basically said, good night, and good luck, you're on your own. And after that bald act of infidelity in 1793, the United States did not form another military alliance until after World War II. That's quite a long run, 1793 until the end of the 1940s. And 
after committing that act of bald uh, infidelity, he encapsulated it in 1796 in the farewell address in which he said the great dictum for the United States is economic relations with everyone, political connections with no one, or as Thomas Jefferson put it, no entangling alliances. And for the most part, the succeeding generations of American elites, Congress, the public, all listened to that guidance from the founders, avidly expanded westward across the continent, avidly traded abroad and used the US Navy at times to defend US traders, but steered clear of entanglement in the affairs of countries outside North America. And isolationism had such a powerful lock on American history, in part because it had many ideological sources. One of them was, as I mentioned, geopolitics. We were blessed with big oceans and small and relatively benign neighbors. Let's bank on that natural security. Part of it was that Americans were obsessed with the threat of tyranny. They were fearful that engagement abroad would come at the expense of liberty at home. And that's why most Americans did not want to see a large Navy and a large army wielded by the federal government because they thought it would be used against them. And so isolationism was in some ways a protection against too much government and too much interference at home. Another strain was freedom of action, unilateralism. We don't wanna tether or hitch our wagon to other powers. We wanna have freedom of maneuver and we want the US alone to make decisions about its foreign affairs. Racism also played an important role. The United States saw itself as a chosen nation, as a country that needed to perfect Republican government, but it also saw that experiment in Republican government as being a uniquely Anglo-Saxon Protestant endeavor, which is in many respects how Americans justified their sense of chosenness with slavery how they justified their sense of chosenness with trampling on Native Americans as they moved west across the continent and justified taking land from Mexico and trying and failing several times to take over Canada. And when it came to the big debates about expanding beyond North America to Haiti, Cuba, the Virgin Islands, different parts of Latin America, Hawaii, there were many such proposals over the course of the 19th century the answer was always no. And one of the reasons it was no was because Americans were uncomfortable integrating non-whites and non-Protestants into the body politic. And that strain of fear of dilution also played into the anti-immigrant sentiment that began to build in the late 19th century and to peak in the 1920s with the very draconian legislation that was passed in 1924. It began as anti-immigrant sentiment against Asians primarily, but then in the 1920s turned into an effort to block Catholics and Jews from coming in. Immigration of Jews and Catholics dropped by 90% after the, after the legislation of, of 1924. So the um, just to kind of end this, this sort of uh, quick history of the 19th century, I will say that I date the era of isolationism to Pearl Harbor, despite the fact that there were two attempts to get rid of it before World War II. One was in 1898, when the United States picked a fight with Spain to kick them out of Cuba, but then went on to effectively colonize Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, Haiti, Guam, Samoa, and the Wake Islands. Americans were told by President McKinley that we were doing this to take manifest destiny on the road, to spread liberty and republicanism and Christianity. Well, what happened? We turned into an empire that was just as coercive as the Spanish, particularly in the Philippines where a terrible insurgency broke out. 4,000 American soldiers lost their lives, hundreds of thousands of Filipinos died. And Americans said, hey, 
what the hell's going on here? You told us we were taking manifest destiny on the road and we've turned into an empire. No, thank you. Then Woodrow Wilson comes along and he learns the lessons of that failed attempt at internationalism. And he says, I'm gonna take the country abroad, but not as an empire, as a savior. We're gonna make the world safe for democracy. We're going to defeat Prussian autocracy. And then we're going to take the country into the League of Nations to form a pact for perpetual peace. Well, that doesn't work either because Americans are saying, we don't see this, this perpetual peace. We see trenches and Americans dying in Europe. We don't wanna hitch our wagon to the League of Nations because it would compromise our sovereignty. And on three separate occasions, Woodrow Wilson took the League of Nations to the Senate for approval and on three separate occasions, it was voted down. And Woodrow Wilson then declares the election of 1920 to be a referendum on American internationalism and Wilsonianism. And he puts out Jim Cox as the Democratic candidate and the bearer of the Wilsonian torch. Well, what happens? Senator Warren Harding runs as the Republican candidate. His main platform is I stand for the policies of George Washington, no entangling alliances. Harding wins that election in one of the most lopsided contests in American political history. And that begins the long run of isolationism of the interwar brand that did not end until December 7, 1941 with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. I'm gonna really skip very quickly through the 41 to 2016 era, because many of you are familiar with it. Many of you have lived through it. I don't need to tell you the story of Roosevelt cobbling together a centrist compact of, uh, of Republicans and Democrats to bring to life a combination of an idealist and a realist American foreign policy. In many ways, Roosevelt was a cross between McKinley and Wilson. He took the realism from McKinley and he melded it with the, ideal, the idealism of Wilsonianism. And it was that combination of American power welded, melded to American interests, values plus the projection of American power that was the critical and magical mix that brought American internationalism to life that led to a liberal brand of American engagement abroad that not only prevailed during the Cold War, but guided the country well past the end of the Soviet Union. I think what happened after the end of the Soviet Union, however, is overreach began. Ideological overreach in which we assumed that the liberal order that out, outlasted the Soviet Union, we could fling open the doors. We brought Russia into the G8. We brought China into the World Trade Organization. We expanded NATO and the EU. We believed that the Pax Americana was going to be universalized. Then 9-11 comes along and we begin an effort to turn Afghanistan and Iraq into Ohio. Well, guess what? That effort didn't go so well. Russia and China have not docked in our harbor. Afghanistan and Iraq have not turned into liberal democracies. Free trade has worked to the advantage of some, but also to the disadvantage of many. And that I think led to the primal scream that Trump heard, that primal scream being, hey, too much world, not enough America, what about us? And that led in my mind to the America first approach of Trump and to a brand of statecraft that was unilateralist, isolationist, protectionist, and nativist, not coming out of the blue, but in many ways hailing back to the brand of statecraft that guided the United States prior to Pearl Harbor. And I think in many respects, even though Trump didn't read a lot of American history, he was a very astute politician. And he understood that this brand of American statecraft, this American narrative, this part of the American experience and American identity 
still held traction, still got traction, particularly in red parts of the country that turned out to be Trump's political base. Well, instead of easing off and trying to find a new brand of internationalism, Trump took a wrecking ball to the world America made. He isolated the United States. He alienated allies. He slapped free trade pacts, excuse me, protectionist trade on many of our free trading partners. He tried to stare down Iran and North Korea and made no progress on getting their nuclear weapons systems under control, their programs. And that in many respects, I think helps explain why he eventually lost the election. Although I think the pandemic is the main reason he lost the election. And then Joe Biden comes into office and begins to try to repair the damage that Trump has done. Let me begin to conclude with a few thoughts on where Biden is heading and also on where I think he should head. As I said, I don't think the answer today is to throw the Trump era onto the ash heap of history. It's to learn lessons from that era, to salvage what he was doing right and to reverse what he was doing wrong. I think in two respects, Biden has begun to make vital course corrections and they are in my mind essential to the well-being of the United States and global order. The first course correction is to bring the United States back to being a team player. The unilateralism of the Trump era, pulling out of the Paris Agreement, pulling out of the Iran deal, pulling out of the World Health Organization, telling our NATO allies that they're a bunch of slackers and that they're gonna be on their own if they're not careful. Telling the South Koreans if they don't pay their bills, we're packing up. This doesn't make any sense and it particularly doesn't make any sense in a world that is as interdependent and globalized as the one that we live in. No problem that we face can be solved today without the help of a major part of the international system, whether it's global warming, great power conflict, nuclear proliferation, cybersecurity, pandemic, we need the help of many other countries. And the second area where I think that Trump uh, uh, that Biden is correcting for the grievous mistakes of Trump is by bringing the United States back to being a model of Republican governance, to restoring to the Oval Office decency and civility and integrity and the rule of law. I think to have uh, an American president that is missing in action when it comes to the fundamental foundations of liberal democracy was doing grievous harm to our country and to the world at large, and it left many countries shocked and in awe about was what was happening in the country that they saw as the torchbearer of Republican liberal democracy since its inception uh, in, in the late 1700s. So in those two areas, bringing the US back as a team player, bringing the US back as a model of a democracy that's committed to human rights, to the rule of law, to political and civil representation, this seems to me to be uh, essential. There are three areas where I think I would, um, I would say that, that uh, Biden has a lot of work to do. I think he's probably heading in the, in the right direction, but uh, let me, let me um, uh, um, focus on a few of them. One, putting Americans first. I think that America first because of its connotations and because of the way Trump went about it was a mistake. But I also think that Biden is right to talk about a foreign policy for the middle class, trade policies that speak to the needs of working Americans and importantly, investments in the domestic economy to try to bring back the welfare, the living standards of many Americans who are finding it extremely difficult to make ends meet. And I think that primal scream, what about us? Too much world, not enough America. That came from a sense that the American dream was slipping away for too many people. And in my mind, Biden has no choice but to focus on a domestic agenda, infrastructure, healthcare, broadband, 
childcare, bridges, roads, pandemic recovery, because if we don't rebuild our country from the inside out, we're never going to get our foreign policy right. We're never going to rebuild a domestic consensus behind an engaged and enlightened brand of American foreign policy. So I think Biden is right to be a domestic first president. I think he has no choice but to be a domestic first president. The big, big question in my mind is, can he pull it off? Will he be able to get the needed legislation through Congress? Will he get sufficient Republican support? And if not, is he going to reform or ditch the filibuster because he sees it a national emergency to fulfill at least part of his domestic agenda? A second key area that I think we should all keep our eyes on is what I would call judicious retrenchment. I think our big strategic mistakes over the last couple of decades were, was to engage in wars of choice in the strategic periphery, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya. These wars cost a great deal and produced little good. Trump was right to start the process of getting out. Biden is right to continue the process of ending the forever wars. It's painful. Afghanistan is going to be a mess. We can talk about how to avoid that mess, but in my mind, Biden has no real choice but to end the American military presence in Afghanistan, to end combat operations in Iraq, and to begin to focus on the traditional geopolitical agenda of stability in Europe and Asia. I think Americans understand the need to stay put in Europe, they understand the need to confront and deal with the rise of China. Uh, and, and I believe he will be able to sustain bipartisan support for, agenda, for a foreign policy agenda that goes back to those basics and stops focusing on what I would call the strategic periphery. My final comment is, I guess a, a cautionary word about the potential return of an American foreign policy that in my mind is starting to look too ideological and not sufficiently pragmatic. Biden talks in his uh, address last week about the 21st century be being defined by an ideological cleavage between autocracy and democracy. He wants to form an alliance of democracies to face down the autocrats. Tony Blinken is, as we speak in London at the G7, trying to build a united front of democracies. I'm all for standing up to Russia and China and other autocracies on discrete threats. I do not believe that we can afford to go back to a world that is divided into blocks along ideological lines. The world is too interdependent. China will soon have an economy larger than our own. China's Belt and Road Initiative is spreading across Eurasia. China is by far the largest investor in Africa. It has built 70% of Africa's network of, uh, of 4, 4G. We don't even have a 5G provider. And that's one of the reasons that Huawei is making the progress that it is. But my, my point here is that we cannot put the Chinese uh, genie back in the bottle. We should be working in a pragmatic way to figure out how to channel Chinese power and Chinese ambition in the right direction. And that will involve containment on some level. It will involve standing up to China and Russia on many different issues from human rights to security. But I also think we need to, uh, to understand the importance of, under, uh, of, of, of um, dealing with the world as it is and not the world as we would like it to be. And in my mind, that means reaching across ideological dividing lines and not just drawing new lines because I see no choice but to work with all regimes, whether they be autocracies and democracies to deal with the big issues of our day, whether they're global warming 
or pandemics or cybersecurity or terrorism. We are knit together in a way that we've never been before. Putting the democracies together to deal with this world is not going to be enough. I'm going to stop there, Duncan, and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, sir. That was terrific. Um, so the first question is, what, is there, is there a, a, a seminal event in history that you believe has had the largest impact on either the American psyche and its relationship to the current geopolitical landscape? A seminal event affecting the, our current moment? Yes. And, and how we view the world and or maybe you know, I, the answer is we just change over time. Yeah, I mean, I think that I, I think that there are seminal moments out there, some of which I've mentioned, including Pearl Harbor, the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, 9-11, uh, and um, and, and others, but I, I do think that in, in some ways, the seminal moment that is most salient in my mind is the Trump era and the degree to which what we're witnessing today is not just Trump, it's systemic. And we know that because we see it on both sides of the Atlantic. We see that Trump won 74 million votes. It's a very close call. Uh, and it may well be that the Republicans take back the House in, uh, in a year and a half, because this is a, a very hotly contested political uh, landscape that we have in the United States today. And so for me, you know, the big, the big issue of our day is not the rise of China. It is not Putin and what he's doing in Ukraine and his interference in our elections. It's us. It's are we going to recover our equanimity? Are we going to recover our sense of purpose? Are we going to get American democracy back on its feet? Or have we passed through the high watermark of liberal democracy? And we're going to look at the onset of a digital age that increases inequality, that increases polarization, that leads to continuing loss in uh, uh, the manufacturing sector. I mean, I would point out that 42% of the American electorate is white without a college education. That is still a big sector of the American electorate. They're not happy. They feel that globalization has not been working for them in many respects. That's a big problem. And that's why for me, what all of us really need to think through hard is how do we get out of the political crisis that we and our democratic industrialized colleagues are continuing to live through? How can we make sure that this era of populism and illiberalism and nativism is a detour and not the new normal. That to me is the $6 million question of our time. If we get that an answer right, I think we'll figure out how to deal with Russia and China. If we get that answer wrong, I think that China and Russia are gonna have a field day. So given some of the vital interests that this, the person asking the question has, given the vital interest much of the world has in the autonomy of Taiwan, not the least of which is the supply of the most advanced semiconductors in the world, um, should America have a red line that extends to prevent military intervention in the defense of Taiwan if it becomes necessary? And then similar, similarly, for other reasons, do we extend that red line to freedom of navigation in the South China Sea? I believe that we should have a red line on Taiwan. And I think effectively we do have a red line. And that if there were to be a Chinese act of aggression against Taiwan in an effort to integrate Taiwan fully into one China by force, there would be a war. 
Uh, and uh, I think in many respects, were China to engage in that action, there should be a war because it would be a sign of aggressive intent of a sort that, uh, that could not go unrequited, unresponded to. Now, two, two follow on comments. One is that uh, I don't think that that red line should be made explicit. That is to say, I do not believe that we should come out and ratify a new defense agreement with Taiwan. Because for me, the ambi ambiguity that we have today is necessary to prevent Chinese nationalism from potentially boiling over. We can, we can kind of fudge it for now. If we were to say, we stand by, we are, we're deploying forces, we have a defense agreement, in some ways I fear that would make a Chinese attack more likely. My second follow on comment is that under the current circumstances, I think the most dangerous or most likely scenario is an accident, an unintended event. Chinese and American aircraft or vessels running into each other and that causing an ex escalation. And I say that because I think it's very unlikely that the Chinese regime would attack Taiwan. And that's because it knows that it would be game over from the perspective of China's broader integration into the global economy it would lead to the return of a block world. China has been doing very well. China has been growing like gangbusters. China has brought hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in part by becoming a workshop for the world. I think the Chinese regime is smart enough to know that if it attacked Taiwan, that success and that continued growth would be at stake. Okay. So what, what do you think America's strategy should be for dealing with a revisionist China and a revanchist Russia? And, and how, do you, how do you then balance that with taking care of America at home? Well, The $6 million question. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let me see if I can get, get Tony Blinken on the phone to answer that question. Um, let me start with the second and come back to the first. You know, as I said, I think for now, we have to be a country that's focused on the home front. That to me is, and I'll put it, I'll put it bluntly, it's a national security priority. Right, getting the country fixed internally is our top national security priority. And that's because, as I said, I, I really do fear that unless we get our political system back up on its feet, unless we repair the polarization, unless we again make our Congress a functioning body that passes legislation in the interests of the country, we're, we're gonna be in big trouble. Uh, and I do fear that th this is a critical historical moment. We will look back at these years and say, this is the moment when we made critical decisions that tilted the balance in the right way. And if we don't, if we don't recover our forward momentum, then I do think this could be a moment in which the historical progress that history has made, helped along by the United States in a big way, that that tilt of just of history in the in the right direction could be at stake. In terms of Russia and China, I think we 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 just have to compartmentalize and say, okay, these are the areas where we are threatened. These are the red lines. These are the issues where we are unable to accept your behavior, and we can. You know, fine. And I'm guessing that on this call, most of us would, would, would know what those are. But at the same time, say to them, we also understand that in this globalized world, we have no choice but to try to work with you. 
uh, and uh, and and to some extent that that does happen. You know, I, I think it's it is a good sign that Biden and Putin extended a nuclear arms control agreement. It was for me a good sign that when there were 100,000 Russian troops massed on Ukraine's border about two weeks ago, Biden picked up the phone and called Putin and said, hey buddy, let's meet this summer and have a summit. What happened? Those 100,000 troops began to demobilize and go home. So I, I think we can walk and chew gum. I think we can stand up to Russia and China as needed, but at the same time, figure out how to work with them. It's not going to be easy, but I do think that that's what's missing is a place for sustained dialogue across those ideological dividing lines. We have NATO, we have the US-EU dialogue. We're constantly talking to the Japanese and to the South Koreans. We almost never talk to the Russians and the Chinese. Why not? Why isn't there a standing body where on a day-to-day -day basis, we are in the tank talking to high-level Chinese and Russians and others about the big global issues of our day? Once in a while, phone calls between Biden and Xi. Once in a while, meetings between Tony Blinken and his Russian and Chinese counterparts. That's not enough in the world that we live in. History is moving too quickly. We need to find a way to have a more sustained, constructive dialogue on all issues, whether we agree with them on those issues or not. So on the subject of, of getting our own house in order internally, because it's a national security issue, and therefore it affects foreign affairs, um, the question is, do you think President, do you think if President Biden decides to, decides to exercise informational power and begin giving US citizens some concrete answers to things that have baffled the US public in the past, that citizens across the country would start to trust big government again? And I'm thinking maybe, maybe uh, that question relates to you know, why, why are we engaged in certain areas of the world? What, what are we really doing? Why are we really there? Yeah, I mean, I think that the American public is broadly internationalist. The American public understands that we live in a globalized world. The American public is pro free, is pro trade and sees the prosperity of the country wedded to the ability of the United States to import and export goods. And so I, I don't think right now that, we're, that, that, that the situation is one in which we're dealing with a public that, that doesn't get it. I think the public does get it, but it's, but it's deeply polarized on, on many of these issues. Uh, and I, I also think that, as I, as I said, in many respects, the mistakes that we've made in the Middle East have soured the public on internationalism, right? People have been watching their uh, TVs and scratching their heads and saying, hey, wait a minute. We've been in Afghanistan for 20 years. We've spent trillions of dollars and the Taliban keeps taking over more of the country. What's going on here? That's an excellent question. I can't answer that question, but I think the answer is, well, we're leaving. Uh, and so I do think we just have to make harder judgments and set higher bars about the tasks to which the United States is willing to devote blood and, and treasure. The other comment I'd make here, Duncan, is that for me, it's not communication and it's, it's not better speeches that's the problem, it's delivering the goods, i.e. Biden needs to get legislation through Congress that begins to improve the lives of folks out there in middle America that are not finding it easy to make ends meet, right? And, and the numbers don't lie, right? The numbers tell you that 
30, 40 years ago, the biggest employer in the country was GM and the average wage of a GM worker was $30 an hour. Today, the biggest employer in the country is Walmart. The last time I checked, a Walmart worker was making $8 an hour. You know, you can't make it on $8 an hour. Uh, it's hard to make it on $15 an hour. So the, these to me are, are the core issues that, that need to be addressed. I think that folks in Washington are beginning to realize that because Trump drove those issues home. Trump made it very clear that we have a big problem. Uh, and so I, I think for me, you gotta deliver. You gotta get the broadband into rural areas. You need to adjust our trade policies so that average Americans feel that they are benefiting from trade. You need to introduce infrastructure spending so that bridges are repaired and highways open up and people can take trains. To me, it's not rocket science. To me, the big question is, are we going to have the political wherewithal and the political functionality to get this job done? So the other, the other piece that involves loss of jobs in this country besides outsourcing and because besides global trade, and it is what it is, is the rise of automation um, and this expectation of a massive loss of jobs in, in both the middle and lower class. Um, how, how do we address that issue? Should we address that issue? Can that issue even be addressed? Or is it just time marches on and innovation marches on and some jobs are destroyed and new ones are created? You know, I think it's, it is an enormously important question. Because if, you know, if you were to, to say, Duncan, give me one word or a couple of words that best explain this historical moment we're living through, I would say automation comes to mind. The digital revolution, the move away from production line manufacturing to digital production and the social information revolution. It is turning our societies upside down. And if you ask, you know, why is the guy or the gal that used to work at GM now working at Walmart? The answer is probably not trade. It's probably not immigration, it's automation. And we know that because our manufacturing output is roughly the same as it was before, but the percentage of our population producing that manufacturing output has plummeted. And that's because a lot of the stuff is being made by machines. And this is just gonna get worse, right? If you think about AI, if you think about the increasing move toward digital technology, more and more we will see workers made redundant. And so I really do think that one of the most important conversations of our time is the future of work in the digital era. What are people going to do to earn a living wage? How can we educate people to make sure that they have the skills, whether they are in coding or healthcare or data processing to make sure that they have uh, a, a good a good paying job. Uh, this problem is going to get worse before it gets better, simply because it may be that 10 years from now, when we call an Uber, it arrives with no driver. When we go to Chipotle and order our burrito, we may be talking to a robot. This is the reality that we face what does that mean for employment and wages? I don't know, but it's a huge issue. The next question is concerns the 24 hour news cycle. And the question is, how does that play into the current geopolitical agenda of, of the US and other countries? Do they have time to think, decision makers? I, I, you know, I think they, they have time to think, less time than they used to. I think the bigger question is how do we survive politically and ideologically in a world in which social media is leading to so much fragmentation? 
you know, and this this is the big question about Google and Facebook and conspiracy theory and the propagation of false information. You know, do we regulate social media? I don't know. I don't know. Do you know how how do we how do we get to a situation in which we have a shared set of facts? I mean, I I find it mind-boggling and profoundly distressing that a sizable portion of the American electorate believes that Donald Trump won the 2020 election. They believe that, they honestly believe it. A sizable portion of the members of Congress continue to say that they believe that Donald Trump won the election. I, I, I don't know, I mean, what, what, what can you say to that? And the same problem occurs abroad. You know, I've been to Russia a number of times over the last few years and been engaged in some pretty heated conversations about world affairs. And I'll say something like, why does the Russian government support a regime in Syria that gasses its own population? And I will hear back, and this is from Russian elites, intellectuals, foreign policy specialists, it was the rebels that unleashed chemical weapons supplied by the United States. Or I will ask, why is it that Russia has troops in Eastern Ukraine? That's a violation of sovereignty. We have no troops in Eastern Ukraine. Separatists are protecting ethnic Russians against neo-Nazis in Ukraine. In other words, there is not a shared set of facts that reasonably educated people can rely upon to have a conversation. This is a, this is a huge problem. Uh, I, I again don't have the solution as I don't have the solution on what to do about the future of work. But again, I would add this to the list of conversations that we, that we need to have. And I do think that some kind of regulation of the social media market is necessary because you know, we can't live in a, in a liberal democracy in which there isn't a shared set of facts. Democracies can't function along those lines. Should there be, so getting back to where, when, and why the US should engage or not engage, U.S. alliances, U.S. partnerships, should there be some future, should there be an overarching criteria that defines when we engage, when we don't engage, who we have alliances with, partnerships with? You know, I, I think that <laughs> that this is kind of, uh, you know it when you see it in the sense that there are still vital interests out there. Right that stem from concrete geopolitical facts. Where is power? Which countries have weapons and industry and high tech? And I, we more or less know the answer to that. And, and that's why I come back to a return of a geopolitical focus on the large swath of land that we call Eurasia. Uh, that is still the part of the world where I think America's core national security interests uh, are, are um, prioritized. Now, that doesn't mean I would turn my back on Africa or turn my back on the Middle East, but I do think that we would be wise to lean in to non-military forms of engagement in these regions. I think as Biden pulls back from the Middle East, he should lean in diplomatically. And I would also go so far as to say that we have over-militarized our national security agenda and spent too much money on traditional national security platforms and not enough on emerging threats, right? We're, we're at what, 550, 575,000 dead Americans from the pandemic? Shouldn't we be spending more money on global health? Shouldn't we be leaning into building new forms of cooperation and early warning on pandemics? 
What about cybersecurity? Uh, we know that the Russians just hacked big time into the American computer system. Are we spending enough on cyber issues? What about climate change? You know, I mean, I, I, have, I have young children and I was just thinking the other day about what, where are we gonna go on vacation? Yeah, maybe we'll go to, to Bethany or somewhere on the Delaware shore, probably the same place that, that you folks go to because you live in Baltimore. And it dawned on me that when my kids are middle-aged, when they're my age, Bethany may not exist. It's probably gonna be underwater. Uh, so we need to start thinking through whether that kind of threat to our national security doesn't need more attention and more money. That doesn't mean, I mean, I'm not a fan of cutting the defense budget, but I am a fan of figuring out what the real threats to American well-being are and what we need to do to get at them. So we've always had this debate, and I can't remember the gentleman's name. He was in the State Department. He's up at Harvard's Belfer Center. And he talks about U.S. vital interests and the debate about what's in the vital interest and what isn't in the vital interest. Um, and, you know, where will we engage or not engage? Um, and so a classic example here is that, you know, the Taliban used to forbid women from working and having an education, even receiving health care. You know, they would fill the stadiums for public executions. So do we try and prevent that tyranny from coming back? Is, is that in the vital interest of the United States? Or do we say, no, that's, that's not important enough? So where does that one fit on the scale, if you will? Yeah. I think we're going to have to make some very tough calls and make judgments that at times make us uncomfortable morally. And this would be one of those places in the sense that I'm I'm all for using USAID and US leverage and political pressure to make sure that women can go to school in Afghanistan and that they reserve and preserve the rights that they have won since the fall of the Taliban. Do I believe that we should continue to wage war in Afghanistan to that end? I do not in part because I believe that it's not succeeding in attaining that end. You know, other areas where I find myself straying into morally uncomfortable terrain is on refugees. What the European Union today is doing on refugees is immoral. They're bribing the president of Turkey to keep Syrians in Turkey, and they're bribing the militias of Libya to keep Africans in squalid camps in Libya. It's kind of stomach turning. Is it the right thing to do? Probably, why? Because if Europe is overrun by more migrants, it will be overtaken by the far right. And the alternatives for Germany and the national rally in France will come to power. Do I think that we need to do things on our border with Mexico, that border on the questionably moral? Yes, I do. Uh, why? Because I think countries need to have control over their borders. So uh, it makes me uneasy to even say this kind of stuff, you know, in public. But we live in a world we're gonna, where we are going to have to make very tough judgments. And I think we have to raise the bar when it comes to what we consider vital interests that are worthy of the expenditure of blood and treasure. All right, so now that we got through the easy ones, <laughs> what's your views on the Iran agreement? Uh, the Iran agreement is terrible and it's the best we can do. Uh, in other words, you know, at my own sense, and I didn't work on it when I was in the White House under Obama, that it was as far as the US could get with the Iranians, and I think also with the Russians and the Chinese before letting the deal collapse. Uh, and so I, I think it, it's better than nothing. And I think it speaks volumes that if you say, okay, Trump backed out of the deal, what good did it do us? The answer is, well, it meant that the Iranians stockpiled much more enriched uranium 
they put in new generation centrifuges and they enriched to 20%. And now they're talking about enriching above 20%. In other words, by pulling out of the deal, we gave Iran the right, or at least the justification to go back to producing what could potentially be weapons grade uh, material. So I think we need to reinstate that deal or get a new deal. But I take the point that many are making that we also have to deal with two other issues simultaneously. One is the ballistic missile program of Iran and the other is the, uh, the terrorist behavior, the difficult behavior, the support for jihadist groups in, in the broader region. Do I think we can stuff all of that back into a big omnibus agreement? No. But what I would, would do is get the nuclear program back in the box at the same time that we also try to address those, those other issues. Okay. Sir, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for, for your talk tonight and, and answering the tough questions and being brutally honest and upfront and not pulling any punches. And uh, we really do appreciate that. Um, so with that, to, to our folks out there, just let me put in a plug for our next, our next webinar. Um, if you want to save the date, the announcement will hopefully go out tomorrow. But the next webinar is the 19th of May. And uh, the next speaker is going to be Dr. Mark Hugo Lopez. And he's the Director of Global Migration and Demography Research at the Pew Research Center. So he's going to talk about global migration and he's going to talk about U.S. immigration. Um, he's going to talk about the numbers. He's going to talk about the policies. He will not give a personal opinion because Pew Research doesn't do that. No matter how hard I try or what questions you guys ask, he's not going to he's not going to render an opinion. He's just going to tell you the facts. Well, I, I was good giving you some of my opinions tonight. So there you, you let him so off the good. hook. So anyways, again, for folks out there, the 19th of May, and we're going to talk about global migration and U.S. immigration. And again, to Dr. K K oh, I can't say it, Kupchen, thank you, thank you, thank you again. And to the folks who dialed in tonight, thank you for attending. Stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you in a thank few you, weeks. Thank you, Duncan. It's been a pleasure. And, and maybe I can get a rain check when we can do this in person. <laughs>